The Bible is full of prophets whose job was to speak for God and tell the future. Here are some cases when God's messengers seem to get it right, including a couple predictions that can only be found by reading between the lines. Numerous biblical prophets talk about the restoration of Israel, and given the complicated history of Jerusalem, they could be referring to a number of conquests. For example, during the Second Temple period, the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt after the Babylonian conquest. Then again, the Second Temple was again destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. On the other hand, some believe that the restoration of Jerusalem promised by the major prophets refers to the creation of the modern nation-state of Israel in 1948. One piece of evidence used to make this argument is a detail from the book of Jeremiah. In chapter 16, the prophet states that God will regather his people from where they have been scattered, that is, the Jewish diaspora that sent the people of Israel and Judah all over the world. And God specifically says, I am now sending for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. These fishermen and hunters are taken to mean the enemies of the Jews, particularly Nazi Germany, whose persecution of the Jewish people led to the creation of a new state of Israel, leading many diaspora Jews to return to their ancestral land. Since the Bible was largely written by people living in or having some connection to the nation of Israel, it stands to reason that most of its prophecies relate to the fate of Israel in some way. We do not know where any of the Gospels were written, or when they were written, or by whom they were written. Those are all things that we have to conjecture. This includes apocalyptic visions that almost universally predict the destruction of God's enemies and a restoration of Israel to eternal glory. As a result, some more conservative Christian commentators who believe they'll inherit the glorious new kingdom have closely watched the war between Israel and Hamas that began in late 2023. In chapter 12 of Zechariah, one of the minor prophets, the Lord declares through his earthly representative that Jerusalem will achieve a major victory over its enemies, and the passage uses some colorful imagery to describe it. Namely, God says, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of reeling for all the surrounding peoples. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it shall grievously hurt themselves. Why does God need to protect Jerusalem to such a degree? Because, according to Zechariah, all the nations of the earth shall come together against it. Conservative Christian commentators see this as a reference to the modern day in which nations like Turkey, Russia, and Iran seem to be targeting Israel. Israel, however, has survived, as if God has kept his promise to protect Jerusalem. The authors of the Gospels, particularly Matthew, were determined to show that Jesus fulfilled prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures, largely in order to validate their claim that Jesus was the Messiah. Besides the claims made about Jesus' birth, such as his being born in Bethlehem of a virgin, some Christian groups believe his life fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Hebrew Bible. For example, Hosea 11.1 1 says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Some Christians believe this refers to Mary, Joseph, and the infant Jesus returning from Egypt after hiding there because Herod was trying to kill them. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses tells the Israelites God will raise up a prophet from among them, which has been interpreted to mean Jesus. The fact that Jesus' legs weren't broken as he hung on the cross is seen to be predicted by the description of the Passover lamb in Numbers 9.12. Even smaller details, such as people mocking Jesus at his crucifixion, are said to be a fulfillment of Psalm 22.7, which says, All who see me mock me. Who hit you? Guess. Prophesy. Who hit you next? However, it's worth noting that the Gospel authors were motivated to convince people Jesus was the Messiah, so these details of Jesus' life may have been added in order to fit these particular verses, many of which aren't even from prophetic religious writings. One of the more extended passages from the Hebrew Scriptures believed by Christians to be a reference to the life and death of Jesus is a figure from the book of Isaiah known as the Suffering Servant. Isaiah describes this figure beginning in chapter 52, but the bulk of the passage is in chapter 53. The suffering servant is someone who's oppressed and afflicted, but nevertheless acts wisely and will be exalted for it. The Gospel authors point out many parallels between this passage from Isaiah and the life of Jesus. When Jesus heals his disciple Peter's mother-in-law, Matthew writes that this fulfills the claim that the servant, quote, took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Do you want to be healed? In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the disciples they need to arm themselves, because Isaiah says that the servant will be counted among the lawless. For modern Christians, the figure of the servant as someone who, through violent death, takes on the burden of their sins is revealed in the death of Jesus. Alternative interpretations of the suffering servant prophecy abound among both the Jewish and scholarly communities, but perhaps the most common understanding is that the servant represents the people of Israel itself, 
who have been, and would continue to be, oppressed by foreign powers such as the Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, and Romans. Other groups, however, interpret the passage as the promise of some non-Jesus Jewish Messiah. Perhaps the only part of the biblical Christmas story you know is the bit Linus recites in the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. If that's your only frame of biblical reference, then you're probably not familiar with the parts where the king of Roman Judea ordered a whole bunch of babies to be killed. This was done in the hope that one of them might be Jesus, who King Herod worried might be trying to replace him as king of the Jews. This episode is popularly known as the Massacre of the Innocents and can be found in Matthew chapter 2. The order was to kill every child in Bethlehem under two years of age. The author of Matthew explains that this slaughter of babies is the fulfillment of a prophecy from Jeremiah 31, reading, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children, because they are no more. Rachel here refers to the wife of the Israelite patriarch Jacob and represents the women of Judea crying over their children lost in the massacre. It's important to note, however, that most mainstream scholars don't believe such a massacre ever happened, and the larger context of the verse from Jeremiah makes it clear he is, on at least one level, talking about Israelite captivity in Babylon and Assyria. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, aka the Mormons, also believe that the promises of the Bible have come true. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 that the kingdom of God, quotes, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. Mormons understand this passage to refer to what they call the Great Apostasy, which was a period following the deaths of the original apostles in which the true gospel and priesthood was lost, and many churches were formed by well-meaning people who loved God but didn't have the complete truth. And by well-meaning people, they meant Catholics and Protestants. In Acts 3.21, however, the Apostle Peter promised that there would come, quote, a time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. I saw a pillar of light. Mormons believe this refers to a restoration of the true gospel that occurred in 1820, when God called Joseph Smith to be his prophet and return God's lost message to humanity. His authority was amplified in 1829 when, according to the Mormon church, John the Baptist appeared to him and anointed him as a priest of the true priesthood. The next year, Smith founded the Mormon Church, allegedly in fulfillment of Peter's declaration. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, God tells the prophet Ezekiel to take two sticks and write on one of them, for Judah and the Israelites associated with it, and on the other one, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with it. Then God says to take the two sticks in one hand until they become one stick. The message seems to be that the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah will be reunited. For Mormons, however, this prophecy isn't about a united Israel, but rather about the restoration of the Word of God. In this interpretation, the stick of Judah is the writings of the people of Judah, the Bible, and the stick of Joseph is the writings of Joseph Smith, in other words, the Book of Mormon. As a result, Latter-day Saints believe Ezekiel was prophesying a restoration of the true gospel of Jesus Christ through the union of the Bible with the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith is believed to have translated the latter from golden plates given to him by an angel, which contained the history of Jesus' interactions with the indigenous peoples of America before the arrival of European colonizers. There's one ancient Jewish text containing what Christians believe is a prophecy fulfilled in Jesus that's particularly fascinating, although many Christians don't consider the book the passage comes from truly biblical. The book in question is The Wisdom of Solomon, a Jewish text from the first century BC found in Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, but not Jewish or Protestant ones. Nevertheless, some Protestant Christians point to the Wisdom of Solomon as a proof text that the life of Jesus was a fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. Verses 12 through 20 of this chapter describe a righteous man who, quote, calls himself a child of the Lord and who the people of Israel will condemn to a shameful death because he reproaches them for sins against the law. But because he is truly righteous and a child of God, God will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If you approach scripture from a Christian perspective, it's probably pretty difficult not to see that as a description of Jesus, especially compared to, for example, the words of the chief priests mocking the crucified Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, which reads, He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The most famous New Testament book about, or at least commonly interpreted to be about, the end of the world is the book of Revelation. However, there are other passages throughout the New Testament that talk about what the conditions will be like leading up to and during God's final judgment on the world. One such passage is the so-called Olivet Discourse, which the Gospel of Matthew records as a discussion Jesus had with his disciples on the Mount of Olives about the end times. 
This extended discourse is frequently cited by Christians who believe in the rapture because of warnings such as, then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Some more evangelical Christians argue that the circumstances of the modern day fulfill the warnings of the end times in the Gospels and the letters of Paul. Jesus of Nazareth was an apocalyptic Jewish prophet. He was going around preaching about the coming kingdom of God. Jesus' predictions in Matthew 24 of wars and rumors of wars, as well as famines and earthquakes in various places, are seen by some to reflect contemporary events. In his first letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul warns that the period leading up to the end of the world would be a godless time, writing, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unfeeling, implacable, slanderers, profligates, brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. To modern evangelicals, these words describe our modern world to a T. So were the last days at hand? Maybe. And again, when has there ever not been war or kids who disobey their parents?